Welcome to Talking Business, a podcast produced in Melbourne, Australia. The podcast is available on the ACAST site, my own website, the Apple Podcast Store, or wherever you go to your podcasts. Or you can get it at the Business Acumen website at www.businessacumen.biz or at Banking Day. For the most exclusive access to leading economists and business leaders from around the world, subscribe to Talking Business from my website, leongetler.com. I am Leon Gettler. My job is to review and monitor the week's news in business, finance and economics. I bring it all to you every week. This is episode number 13 in our series for 2023, and today's date is Friday, April the 28th. First, I'll be talking to Tammy Cassiou, founder and chair of Philatima, which is an international business operating in Timor List, which runs IMS, International Mobility Solutions, a job placement organisation, and ISAT, Industry Safety Assessment and Training, a training organisation. And I'll be talking to AMP Capital Chief Economist Shane Oliver, but now let's talk to Tammy Cassio. Well, Tammy, tell us about your business in Timor List. Well, we, we started in 2010. We were invited by the UN to do some capacity building in the final year before they handed over operations to the government. Started off with ISAT, which was a, a skills development and capacity building company. And from there, we've now got quite a few businesses uh, operating in Timor-Leste. Uh, we've got Philotimo Group. We have IMS, International Mobility Services. Brand it All, which is uh, supplying logistics and uh, workwear to industry. And Forge, which has recently started in building community housing and sustainable living projects. So we've got quite a few few businesses going now over the last 10 years. How are these businesses actually benefiting Timor Leste? We've really focused on investing in human human capital investment. Primarily, a lot of our work is in developing skills and creating jobs. We believe that the road to prosperity for Timor Leste is, you know, everyone wants a job. If they've got a job, they can build their own houses, they can build their own infrastructure instead of, um, you know, we've had the last decade of perhaps the NGO flavour. We are moving into a commercial phase for Timor Leste, and the best way is to create lots and lots of jobs. But people need to be skilled to international standards to be able to uh, have, you know, quality infrastructure and quality living. Right, okay. So what, what are the business challenges of growing and managing a business in a developing nation? <laughs> quite a few, Leon, quite a few. Um, it's certainly not for the faint-hearted and the innovation is very, very key. And also a long-term vision, not over sort of three years, you need to look ahead perhaps 50 years uh, or so to to really start putting the foundations in place to, to have a look at the return over a long-term period instead of very um, short. Uh, to give you to give you an example, my a typical day in team or less for me could be I've got my high heels on, I've got my corporate suit, and 9 a.m. I uh, I'm having a meeting with a minister, and then at 11 a.m. I uh, I'm overseeing the distribution of rice to some of the villagers. So <laughs> you have to um, be quite flexible and very open-minded to doing business a different way. So how are the people in Timor this taking to the business? Uh, look, it, it has been, uh, some of the challenges have been trying to build uh, a skilled workforce for, for the companies where they could operate you know, on par with other international businesses because there was quite quite a, a gap, but really, really well. Um, we that building that trust uh, around you know an international shareholder coming in and an investor with the uh, with locals has been ch a challenge, but quite rewarding once once that comes together. And you know, to to give you an idea, at the moment there's about five hundred million dollars worth of goods that are imported into Timor. Now, only 2% of that is currently coming from Australia. The rest is coming from China and Indonesia primarily. But that, that has been the opportunity where, you know, we've grown our workforce to over 100, 100 staff at the moment. And over the next 12 months, uh, we forecast that that may double. Um, 
the benefits are really about us creating jobs and giving uh, skills, uh, you know, for for that long term prosperity. I'd imagine one of the issues you face uh, recruiting people is uh, finding people with the right skills. And that, would that be an issue, uh, Tim, on this? Oh, look, absolutely. Um, everybody wants a job, you know. Everybody is, uh, you know, the work ethic is uh, very very sort of exciting but the skill level is a challenge uh, and so we have got a very and I suppose that's where one of our entities ISAT come into it where we've invested in uh, taking 20 uh, industry people and putting them through a training and development program for them to become trainer or assessors qualified under the Australian standards. Now you know our trainer and assessors are really helping us ensure that one, we can build our own work- workforce with the right skills to be able to compete internationally, but also to be able to impart that knowledge and build a sustainable workforce pool across Timor Leste. What's the demographic of your workforce? Um, look, we it's interesting. We our recruitment's open for everybody. We have got quite a diverse workforce um, where even women in the workplace, uh, to give you a good example, is we had uh, one of our general managers for Brand at All, one of our companies, is a uh, female, uh, very emerging young leader. Uh, you know, she's a mom. Uh, there are uh, challenges that she's had to overcome in the last, you know, 12 months, but very, very successful in her role with the right support around her. But our demographic is generally between the ages of 18 to about 45. How did you assist the country to recover from those floods and COVID? Yes, uh, you know, apart from the, the basic needs of uh, providing, you know, food, shelter, and um, assisting the coordination and logistics of medical supplies. One of the things that was um, highlighted through the floods is the poor quality of the infrastructure, in particularly with housing, in particular with bridges, roads, or the basic infrastructure. Uh, so we have just launched a trade uh, apprenticeship program where Forge, one of our entities, will be building two houses to Australian standards with apprenticeships, um, around around apprenticeship, 80 apprenticeships in the traditional trades, to be able to start to build that skill level. Because primarily what's happened in Timor-Leste, a lot of the labour has been imported to build the infrastructure in the past. So we, we see that as a cornerstone to be able to have local people building the infrastructure to international standards and creating jobs. Because we, we need to, for the road to prosperity for Timor-Leste is jobs. And we don't just need 10,000 jobs. We need hundreds of thousands of jobs, which can happen through, you know, the construction of the infrastructure and perhaps some of the aid funds that will come to timor but also building partnerships. And we're really, really excited to hear about uh, Santos's vision of developing Northern Australia and Timor-Leste because uh, through that local content and the building of business partnerships, perhaps, you know, from Australia and Timor-Leste, there could be that creation of a lot of commercial jobs and the and building that private sector in Timor that is quite underdeveloped. Over the years, people from Timor List have been helping Australian farmers. We have got some challenges uh, because of the, you know, the the COVID nineteen cases have have been increasing in Timor List. There is the vaccination program which Australia is supporting, which is great, but it has put a higher risk profile on us being able to mobilise people to Australia. So we've refocused a little bit in providing add-on skills and getting people prepared for when the borders do open, we can hopefully support the farmers in Australia by mobilising workforce from here. Okay, and uh, how are the workers taking to that? Uh, look, they, they're excited, but they, you know, they are very keen to go to Australia and, um, you know, work, uh, which is, you know, everybody's sort of dream from here. But it, it is a challenge trying to communicate. So, look, you know, we will, uh, the borders will hopefully open again and uh, those opportunities will be there. But 
it, you know, we don't have a finite date of when that will happen. Well, Tammy, it's been fascinating talking to you. Thank you very much for your time. No, thank you very much, Leon. Lovely to talk to you too. And now let's talk to AMP Capital Chief Economist Shane Oliver. Shane, inflation seems to be heading down. Uh, what's your view about that? Well, we have seen some better news lately, both globally and in Australia. If you look at the US, the inflation rate peaked uh, in the middle of last year, just over 9%. It's since fallen back to 5%. Obviously, the underlying components to it are still a bit sticky, particularly in services. But even there, there's uh, clear evidence that it looks to have peaked and is slowing down as well. And supporting all of this, I guess, has been improvements on the supply side of the global economy. A lot of the shortages we were seeing 18 months ago seem to have faded. Freight costs have come down. And at the same time, demand has slowed down, which, of course, is taking pressure off prices. Uh, in Australia, we're about six months behind the US, but it does look like our inflation rate peaked in the December quarter at around 8%, depending on whether you look at the quarterly measure or the, the, uh, the monthly inflation indicator. And data for January and February has shown a decline in inflation uh, from around that 8% level down to below 7%. So again, it looks like inflation's peaked. There's still a fair way to go. It's still too high. So central banks aren't about to start cutting interest rates, but we are seeing more evidence that they are either at the top or getting close to it. Uh, but the problem is inflation is quite sticky. It's, uh, once it's high up, it's very hard to come down. That's right. The longer it stays up, the longer it takes to get it back down again. So far, it has started to come down, which is a good sign, um, suggesting this is not going to be a rerun of the 1970s, where it, it sort of stayed high for uh, 15 years in the US and then come down to the early 80s. And, and at the time, took a lot of effort to get it down to very high short-term interest rates. But by then, of course, inflationary psychology had become embedded in economies both in Australia and the US. At present, uh, we don't have that same inflation psychology, which suggests that it should be easy to get back down. But there's still a fair way to go yet, which uh, bottom line is that uh, interest rates are still going to be high for a while to come. Even if you do believe that they've peaked out, they're not going back to those low interest rates that we saw a year or two ago anytime soon. Right, because the Fed's still talking about raising rates, keeping it going till they get inflation right down. Yeah, the Fed is talking about doing another one in May. So that's why I mean uh, when I say that we're getting close to the top, if not at there. Um, but, yeah, the risks in the short term are still some more upside. The general expectation, I think, is that we'll, we'll probably see another hike from the Fed in May uh, and then they'll, they'll most likely go on pause. Uh, depending on what the, the data does. But we've gone from a phase where central banks seem to be just raising interest rates automatically to one where they're now much more data dependent. They're looking at the economic data. We have seen the Bank of Canada um, leave interest rates on hold now for two meetings in a row at 4.5%. We've seen a similar story from the Bank of Korea, uh, the Malaysian Monetary Authority, um, paused interest rates late last week, and, and we've certainly seen a slowing in the pace of rate hikes, if not um, clear evidence that they've peaked. Bottom line is, yes, we could still see some more upside from here on interest rates, but we are either at the top or, I think, getting pretty close to it. And whereas the Reserve Bank announced a pause last time, there's still an expectation they may increase it one or two more times? That's right. Economists are uh, sort of split on this. There's a, a camp that says they need to raise rates into the or above 4%. Um, the consensus, I think, is for one more rate hike in Australia, and there's also a bunch of economists who think that, well, we've seen the peak. We're in the latter camp, but I must admit I, I feel nervous about it because obviously there's a lot riding on upcoming inflation data in Australia, which comes that next week. If it's on the high side, we could easily tip the Reserve Bank over into one more hike uh, at their May meeting. And, of course, we have seen continuing strong jobs data in Australia, and also we've seen uh, signs that the property market has turned around you know, since the, the low point back in February. The five capital city average property prices, according to CoreLogic, they're up nearly 1.5%, and in Sydney they're up nearly up around 2.5%. So that, that runs with the risk that it will reverse the negative wealth effect um, from higher interest rates, pushing property prices down and therefore spending down and maybe another trigger for the Reserve Bank raising interest rates again. So the risks are still on the upside in Australia, but I think we're either, we, we, even if we do see more hikes, I think we're getting pretty close to the top because there is a lot of damage being done to the economy 
even estimates by the Reserve Bank estimate that something like 15% of home borrowers, at least with variable rates, will be in negative cash flow by the end of this year. In other words, that's a situation where their income is less than their living expenses and their mortgage payments. And obviously, that's going to be a big dampener on uh, on spending as the year proceeds. And I think as that that dampening on spending occurs, you're going to see more downside on inflation. But you know, we're still a bit touch and go in the short term, and I'm not going to rule out uh, further rate hikes from here because that's certainly a risk. Uh, and I mean, the, the jobs figures have been interesting. Uh, you know, stayed steady at 3.5 percent. They certainly have, and that's on the strong side. We thought we might have seen um, a bit of an uptick to 3.6 percent. They did bottom out, uh, I think, around November last year, down around 3.4%. And, and since then, I guess you could argue they've stabilised, so the jobs market is not getting any tighter, but it's still pretty tight. Uh, we are seeing signs of falling job vacancies. Job vacancies have fallen for three quarters in a row, uh, which warns that the labour market will start to slow down, but right now it's still pretty tight, and that obviously runs with it another risk, and that is that uh, you may see stronger growth in wages, particularly with New South Wales and Victoria relaxing or removing the caps on public sector pay gains and also uh, you know, pressure for even faster uh, increases in minimum wages going into the next minimum wage case. So all of those things obviously do imply some upwards pressure uh, on wages, and that's another risk for the Reserve Bank, which will keep them I guess a little bit nervous about things and is, yes, another reason why you can't rule out further hikes from the RBA. Right, and of course uh, there's a view that with the slowing of the economy, the unemployment rate will rise up. It won't spike, but it might go up to about 4%. Yeah, I think I think it will go, and that's, that's the balancing act here. On the one hand, you know, you want to do enough to uh, control inflation, to stop it staying at high levels indefinitely, making it even harder to get down in the longer term. But by the same token, you don't want to over-tighten and plunge the economy into recession. And the difficulties in doing this are quite immense because there's a long lag from changing interest rates to actually seeing an impact on the economy, as we've seen over the last year or so. And so that's that's the difficult balancing act here. I, I think we are going to see a slowdown in the economy um, and we are going to see a rise in unemployment uh, back above the 4% level. But you don't want to push that so far that it, that it you know, takes us into recession. And that, I think, is, is a difficult uh, exercise for the Reserve Bank. It's why they keep saying, Governor Lowe keeps pointing out, that we're tracing out a narrow path here between doing enough to control inflation but not doing so much as to knock us into recession. And uncertainty around that remains, obviously, remains pretty high. Well, the other interesting part is about the rise in immigration here and what impact will that have, say, on property prices? Well, on the one hand, the rise in immigration is good news because it eases labour market uh, pressures and it may be a factor as to why job vacancies have been falling as immigrants and uh, the return of foreign students take up those roles. And, and it's been a huge bounce. You know, we're looking at potential net migration this year, around 350,000 people. The norm was about 250,000, could, could in fact spike up to 400,000. That, of course is resulting in very strong population growth. Population growth this year could push up towards 2%. The norm is around 1.5%. Um, of course, that followed a period of very uh, weak population growth or negative, uh, slightly negative population growth through the pandemic. Um, but it is returning with a vengeance. So the good news is that it takes pressure off the labour market. The bad news, though, is that it is putting a lot of pressure on the property market. We came into this year with already very low rental vacancy rates in Australian capital cities. The average is down is less than 1%, which is a record low, and that's obviously resulting in upwards pressure on rents. And it's, it's quite common to hear stories of people seeing 15, 20% increases in their rent, sometimes more when they come off a lease. Uh, so that's creating a lot of pain. Uh, but obviously, it's also indicative of a very tight property market and is starting to, to arguably offset the impact of lower interest rates in terms of property prices and possibly explains why property prices have started to, to increase uh, again recently, particularly in Sydney, Melbourne and elsewhere, um, because we've moved back into a shortage of property. So on the one hand, you know, interest rates are high, interest rates are double, mortgage rates are sort of double what they were um, a year ago, and that has had the effect of reducing the capacity to pay of new borrowers. 
coming into the property market on our estimates, someone on average full-time earnings with a 20% deposit, their capacity to pay, given what they can borrow now, has fallen by more than 25%. Uh, so historically, that's been a negative for property prices and why we thought prices would continue to fall. But that seems to be getting swamped or offset by the uh, the shortage of property, uh, particularly as immigrants return to the to the market. And of course, that's prompting bargain hunters to get in there while prices are still down on the fear that if they don't, they'll miss out. So-called FOMO seems to be returning. So there, there is a lot of conflicting forces on the property market uh, right now, uh, but it, it does seem as if we've come back into a, a chronic supply shortage yet again. And that's obviously a a longer term problem for Australia in terms of housing affordability. So Shane, what you're saying is over the next 12 months, there's going to be a lot to watch out for with the economy. Yeah, I, th I think there's a lot of balls in the air and it's going to be uh, an interesting environment. We, we are optimistic that inflation will come down and that will enable central banks to get off the break and enable a, a you know, relatively soft landing, uh, which in turn would support investment markets or at least share markets as you know, as, as earnings you know, manage to avoid a, a sharp contraction and yet interest rates come down. But obviously the risks around that are still high. We're still in a, a fairly uncertain period. Um, and obviously there is a danger that central banks over tighten and cause a sharper contraction in the economy, hitting profits and therefore share markets. So the risks are still high. And when you put that together with what's going on in property markets, it's, uh, it's certainly an interesting environment. Well, Shane, thank you so much for your time. It's quite been quite illuminating. Thank you. Thanks, Leon. Take care. So what's happening in the news? Well, Fox News Media has sacked its top-rated host, Tucker Carlson, less than a week after parent company Fox Corps paid $787.5 in a defamation lawsuit in which Carlson played a starring role. Carlson was fired a week after Fox settled the defamation lawsuit brought by Dominion Voting Systems, in which his private texts were publicly released. The message showed Carlson being occasionally critical of Fox management and using misogynistic language. The network is also facing legal action from Abby Grossberg, a former booker for Carlson's show, who alleged she faced a sexist and hostile work environment. Fox is contesting her allegations, while Carlson has not publicly commented on the suit. The outspoken Carlson embraced conservative issues and delivers his views with a style that made his primetime show, Tucker Carlson Tonight, the highest rated cable news program in the key 25 to 54 age demographic on the most watched US cable news network. Shares of Fox closed 2.9% lower on the news, which the company announced on Monday. Dominion Voting Systems alleged in its lawsuit that Carlson allowed debunked election fraud claims about the voting technology firm to air on his show, while casting doubts on the plausibility of those claims in private messages that emerged in legal filings. Carlson is also key to additional legal battles facing Fox, including a lawsuit filed by Grossberg, who said Fox coerced her testimony in the Dominion case. Rosberg last month accused network lawyers of pressuring her to provide misleading testimony and said Fox exposed her and others to rampant sexism and misogyny. Fox fired Grossberg, saying her legal claims were riddled with false allegations against Fox and our employees. And well, Elon Musk's wealth has plunged by $13 billion as the drama of Tesla's first quarter results sending, sending the electric car maker's share down sharply and an experimental Starship rocket designed by SpaceX a cheap liftoff in, uh, in Boca Chica, Texas, only to explode about four minutes later in a fiery ball above the Gulf of Mexico. And on Twitter, as Musk promised two weeks ago, many users lost their legacy blue check marks for choosing not to pay $8 per month for the privilege. When it comes to the billionaire's net worth, Tesla's sinking share price had the most immediate consequences. His wealth dropped by $12.6 billion as a result, according to the Bloomberg Billionaires Index, his biggest decline this year. His stake in Tesla, including shares and options, makes up the biggest part of his $163.9 billion fortune, though SpaceX has become more important as its valuation soars. And confusion surrounding Twitter deepened over the weekend after a number of high-profile accounts saw their prized blue check marks reinstated, even though some of their owners have been dead for years. Celebrities and public figures took to the platform to deny having paid the $8 a month that yields a coloured tick, despite labels stating the account is verified because they subscribed to Twitter Blue and verified their phone number. Unpaid legacy blue ticks, which once conferred authenticity on accounts verified by the company, were removed last week as part of billionaire Elon Musk's push to boost revenue. More bewilderment was in store after people noticed that dead personalities' accounts also sported the label, such as celebrity chef Anthony Bourdain, wife and National Basketball Association player Kobe Bryant. 
Bourdain died in 2018 and Bryant in 2020. Others were angered by the addition of blue ticks for profiles of people such as prominent journalists and columnist Jamal Khashoggi, who was murdered in 2018. The account of former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who was assassinated last year, also received the verified label. None of the profiles appeared to be active. Other deceased celebrities' accounts that supported the blue ticks included singer Michael Jackson, comic book artist Stan Lee and actor Chadwick Boseman, although those accounts have been actively managed by others on their behalf. And central bankers, who manage prisons and exchange reserves, are loading up on gold as geopolitical tensions, including the war in Ukraine, force them to rethink their investment strategies. An annual poll of 83 central banks, which manage a combined $7 trillion in foreign exchange assets, found that more than two-thirds of respondents thought their peers would increase their gold holdings in 2023. Bullion tends to become more attractive in times of instability, and demand has soared over the past year. The amount of gold bought by central banks rose by 152% year-on-year in 2022 to 1,136 tonnes, according to the World Gold Council, a trade body. Most reserve managers surveyed rated geopolitical risk as one of their most important concerns, second only to high inflation, according to the HSBC Reserve Management Trends Survey, published by the Central Banking Publication. More than 40% of respondents listed it as one of their top risk factors, compared with 23% in last year's poll. Around a third of those polled had changed or were planning to change their assets they purchased according to tensions such as Russia's invasion of Ukraine and worsening US-China relations. And Australia's inflation rate has fallen from its December peak, with annual price increases of 7% for the year to March, down from 7.8%. Prices rose 1.4% over the March quarter, which was marginally above average economists' forecast. It was the smallest quarterly rise in more than a year, according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics. And four federal Labor MPs have broken ranks to join calls for the government to increase the job seeker payment to by $24 billion at next month's federal budget. The move came as the government hinted it may increase a $50 a day payment by little in the May 9th budget, but not to the levels demanded by the welfare sector. The Labor MPs, Alicia Payne, Louise Miller-Frost, Michelle Ananda-Raja and Kate Thwaites have added their names to a letter composed by the welfare lobby and independent Senator David Pocock that has so far garnered more than 330 signatures and which will be sent to Prime Minister Anthony Albanese. It comes a week after Treasurer Jim Chalmers rejected the key recommendation from the government's handpicked Economic Inclusion Advisory Group that job seeker be increased to 90% of the age pension, up from about 70%. A single person on job seeker receives up to $347 a week, or $49.50 a day, while a single pensioner gets about $500 a week. A News Corp co-chairman Lachlan Murdoch's battle against small news outlet Crikey is set to continue in a brewing dispute over an almost three six hundred thousand dollar pool of supporter funds after the media scion dropped his defamation litigation. At issue is the five hundred and eighty eight thousand seven hundred and thirty five dollars Crikey raised from its supporters to defend itself from the claim that Murdoch launched last year about an article branding the Murdoch family as unindicted co conspirators in the twenty twenty one riot at the US Capitol. The Murdoch camp believes the money should be deducted from its contribution to Crikey's legal fees, which it will have to pay as a party that withdrew the litigation, so that the website is not effectively compensated for the same expenses twice. But Crikey wants the money to be disregarded by the court, as it works out what Murdoch will have to pay. Crikey promises on its online GoFundMe page that any surplus it receives from the case, including from supporters or a cost order, would go towards a not-for-profit alliance for journalists' freedom. The fundraiser is explicit that the money is to fight Murdoch's legal claim, not to reduce his expenses. Crikey's legal costs total more than $1 million. And almost none of the new and current Reserve Bank of Australia board members have the typical qualifications to serve on a foreign central bank or to set interest rates, according to economists and former bank officials. The first independent review into the RBA in decades has recommended splitting the RBA board into two separate boards, one focused on interest rate setting and the other tasked with governance. Jonathan Kearns, who worked at the RBA for more than two decades before departing to take up a job as Chief Economist at Challenger in January, said the existing board members were all exceptionally well-qualified individuals who have great experience in running complex organisations, but he said they don't have the skills of Monetary Policy Committee members in other central banks. Treasurer Jim Chalmers has given him principal support to all 51 of the review panel's recommendations. The creation of a monetary policy board would bring the RBA in line with central banks overseas and deal with criticisms identified by the review. The current board lacked the knowledge to sufficiently scrutinise of challenge. 
the RBA's underlying economic and financial judgments or policy advice. And tech giant Atlassian says it's re-evaluating its global real estate footprint as a consequence of doubling down on its Team Anywhere remote work policy, which is increasingly making the company an outlier as other firms, including Salesforce, Amazon and Google, begin mandating a return to the office. Work began last year on Atlassian's new Sydney headquarters, a 39-storey behemoth that is said to be the world's tallest hybrid timber tower, anchoring the New South Wales government's planned tech central precinct next to the city's central station. While work on the new HQ is progressing, the Team Anywhere policy means that some 40% of its workers are now located two hours or more from from an Atlassian office and work fully remotely, despite a growing number of companies walking back their remote work policies initiated amid the pandemic. Speaking in interviews at Atlassian's Team 23 conference in Las Vegas, in which a company made several AI and product announcements, executives said they were committed to the Team Anywhere policy, but that it would require a real estate rethink, including the potential closure or reduction of some offices. Atlassian is domiciled in Delaware, but has offices in Sydney, San Francisco, Austin, Boston, New York, Bengaluru, Yokohama, and Amsterdam, among others. And Australia is playing a key role in boosting the global supply of semiconductors, with the world's biggest auto parts supply tapping researchers at a Melbourne university to develop technology to increase output. Car manufacturers are being forced to cancel millions of orders of new vehicles after the year-long war in Ukraine exacerbated an already tight market for semiconductors, which are known as the motor that drives the modern world of technology. This equated to US $210 billion, that's Aussie $313.8 billion, in lost sales. The chips are used in countless products from Hyundai's and Mercedes-Benz's to high-tech sleep apnea machines and toasters, becoming as central to the global economy as oil. Demand is set to continue to soar as more countries mandate the use of electric vehicles, with US President Joe Biden setting a goal for EVs to account for half of all new car sales by 2030, placing further pressure on supply chains. Bosch, the world's biggest auto part supplier, is investing more than 3 billion euro, that's 4.97 billion Aussie, into making more semiconductors and has turned to researchers at Monash University in Melbourne's southeast to help make the chips not only easier to produce, but also more environmentally friendly. And the Albanese government will spend billions of dollars to urgently build factories for the local production of American-designed missiles as part of the Defence Force's biggest shake-up in decades to deter conflict with the rapidly militarising China. The Navy's strike power is also tipped to be significantly expanded and procurement processes for buying new weapons overhauled with more of the -the off-the-shelf purchases when the government releases its response to the Defence Strategic Review on Monday. With military spending poised to surge well past 2% of gross domestic product, local industries fear they will miss out on work because of major foreign, mostly American, defence prime contractors will be favoured as the government moves to buy weapons more quickly. One of the key moves by the government will be the fast-tracking of local production for a suite of missiles for the Army, Air Force and Navy. While Australia will initially source missiles from overseas to build up stockpiles, US contractors Lockheed Martin and Raytheon are in line to receive billions of dollars to establish domestic assembly plants. Those factories will become the long-term supplier of missiles for the Australian Defence Force as part of a shift to greater self-reliance. Crucially, from a US perspective, Australian-made missiles would become a source of secondary supply for the American military, which is suffering from production bottlenecks and supply chain shortages. And the architect of Australia's news bargaining code, which has moved more than $200 million from Google and Facebook to publishers of journalism, says artificial intelligence models such as ChatGPT should similarly be forced to pay for access to content. Rod Sims, the former chairman of the Australian Competition Consumer Commission, says likely large AI models such as Google's BARD and Microsoft's linked ChatGPT have scraped news publications to generate accurate answers. That raises major copyright red flags, Mr Sims says, and puts them squarely in line for designation under the bargaining code. Robert Thompson, the chief executive of News Corp, which publishes the Wall Street Journal, The Australian and The Times, has been the most proactive in calling for AI firms to pay for access to content. He has confirmed news is in discussions with one unnamed AI firm. Mr Thompson was also an early proponent of the media bargaining code. Other publishers are exploring different ways to negotiate with AI firms. The Guardian, has created a global AI working group, while Nine, the publisher of the Australian Financial Review, The Age and Sydney Morning Herald, is understood to be looking to how AI can be applied across other areas of the media business. And a new artificial intelligence AI system, which estimates energy efficiency in Australian homes, is being trialled by Australia's National Science Agency, CSIRO, and property data analytics company CoreLogic Australia. The CSIRO and CoreLogic say that understanding the energy efficiency of homes can help the industry and homeowners to improve energy performance and lower power bills. But before the trial, 
Data on the energy efficiency of homes was limited or not readily accessible. The pilot project combines CoreLogic's 40 years of comprehensive property data with CSIRO's rapid rate artificial intelligence model to produce an estimate of heating and cooling load and an energy efficiency star rating for homes. The CSIRO says the insights from rapid rate will initially be made available to CoreLogic's core banking and finance customers with plans to make it available to other market segments in the future. And KPMG Australia has begun using an enhanced version of its auditing software on local clients, which can search outlier transactions within a complete data set during an audit. The capability, already in use by the firm in the US, UK and Canada, allows KPMG's auditors a faster analysis of more client data and should improve audit quality, which is critical to investors who rely on financial statements to make decisions. The enhancement to KPMG's audit software, called KPMG Clara, uses aspects of artificial intelligence in its operations, such as machine learning, to work out what constitutes a normal transaction within a data set. This use of advanced technology comes after the corporate regulator last October called for KPMG and its big four rival Deloitte to take immediate action to improve their audit processes after it found their standard of audit work had declined dramatically in the previous year. It is also part of an ongoing trend within the world's largest accounting firms and will have long-term implications for the usefulness of audits, as well as the professionals who work within the audit sector. And department store Meyer is facing an unfair dismissal suit from a former women's wear category manager who is accusing her boss of bullying behaviour and is seeking damages of more than $700,000. Former Meyer staffer Patricia Priolo has made the claims under the Fair Work Act, alleging she was dismissed in contravention of general protection. Ms Priolo's career at the department store spanned from October 21, 2019 to January 31 this year. She was initially a category manager in women's wear, By July 2020, she was elevated to category manager for women's wear, footwear and accessories and and reported to Annabelle Talbot, general manager of merchandise for women's wear, beauty, intimates and accessories, according to the statement of claim lodged in the federal court in Victoria. It is alleged that last of November, at a meeting to discuss the Maya women's wear strategy, about 30 people attended in person and via video conferencing. Ms Talbot caused offence and distress to Ms Priolo and others. By the end of January, Ms Priolo's employment at Maya was terminated on alleged redundancy grounds, despite her role not being redundant, and another employer being placed in that, into that position shortly after. Her lawyers have a, have a claim exceeding $708,060, which includes the loss of earnings and lost opportunity to receive short-term incentives, as well as damages for pain, suffering, stress and anxiety of at least $50,000. Ms Talbot remains in her role at Maya. And that's it for this week. And next week I'll be talking to Dr Philip Wooth, who runs Australia's only doctor-led weight loss program, who is concerned about how much weight people gain during COVID and warns the business of weight gain needs to be taken seriously ahead of the next pandemic. And I'll be talking to Rabobank economist Michael Ivory about whether China's economy is actually recovering. In the meantime, you catch me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn and YouTube. And if you want, leave a comment. For the most exclusive access to leading economists and business leaders from around the world, subscribe to Talking Business on the Apple Podcast Store or on my website, leongetler.com. If you want to contact me, email me at leon at leongetler.com. I answer all emails. Wishing you all a safe